All right. So without further ado, I'm going to just load up my learning labs here. The, the link will take you to a filtered view of all of the content in learning labs that contains the tag git. So we're going to cover um, some of, but not all of the material in the Git 100, 101, and 102 learning labs. Um, this is all available online, um, you know, today after the event and so on. So you can come back and reference these things. Before we uh, really dive in, though, I want to kind of give you a general introduction to um, well, me, and then also. Uh, Git before we start doing hands-on things. So uh, my name is Ashley Roach. I am a developer evangelist on the um, the DevNet team. I focus on APIs and cloud, but uh, I cover lots of other things as well. Um, if you want to hit me up on Twitter, you're welcome to. If you want to send me an email, uh, same thing. Uh, so today, what we're going to do is we're going to do a quick overview of Git. Uh, we're going to also do a bit of a workshop so you can see how this stuff works and then the, cover quickly the resources, but those resources are the same ones that are available on uh, that GitHub page. So <clears throat> you might be asking yourself, like, I'm interested in Git, uh, but like, why are we really here? <laughs> because I think this is very, very common. Uh, it was common for me before I invested the time to really learn Git. Uh, and so I'm going to read this for you. This is one person on the left uh, says, hey, this is Git. It tracks collaborative work on projects through a beautiful distributed graph, the graph theory tree model. And the, the woman asks, oh, well, how do we use it? And he says, oh, I don't know. Just memorize these shell commands and type them to sync up. If you get errors, save your work, delete the project, and download a fresh copy. <laughs> So that's the wrong way of using Git. So if you, uh, let's hope that we can kind of evolve our skills uh, out, out of that model. So why would you use version control? I think uh, you probably have been hearing a lot about infrastructure as code. Uh, if, you, if you haven't, um, it's a good term to familiarize yourself with. But as we start defining infrastructure, whether that's switches or data center or containers or these, all these different things, using um, manifests and text files, ultimately, you really want to actually store that stuff in version control and work, get workflows around it so that you can sort of protect yourself and others. So you protect yourself by you know, doing things in branches so you don't overwrite your own work accidentally. And likewise, other people can't go and collide and destroy work that they might um, uh, just do so accidentally. So, so it's a way to think of version control. Most people say, like, why would you use version control? Well, so I can keep versions of things. But I think this is kind of a more personal way about th of thinking of it. Uh, there's different types of version control. There's centralized version control. And then there's distributed version control. And so distributed version control uh, enables you to download an entire copy of the repository onto your workstation. Uh, look at the, all the logs, get all the files, work with it, uh, and then contribute it back to uh, a main repository. And this is an example of a, fl of a workflow um, that um, enables a, a path where it's pretty common for development teams. And so infrastructure teams may adopt this same kind of pattern, where you work on your own local copy, you submit it to a public place, where someone can then review the information uh, and then subsequently bless it. So this integrated integration manager, bless it and put it into the real repository. So you can see this happen a lot on GitHub. Um, and by the way, uh, we're going to mess with GitHub a bit. So if you want to play along, uh, make sure you load up your GitHub account. Uh, or if you don't have one, sign, sign up for GitHub uh, while I'm talking through these uh, overview slides. Um, centralized version control is the other thing that you might be used to if you're not doing a lot with Git. That's like SVN, uh, Subversion, and like CVS. In those models, you check out a file, um, and then no one else can work on that file. In distributed version control, you can be working on the same file. 
you do have to consolidate, or when you do consolidate, you'll have to reconcile sometimes, but it, it enables this more distributed way of working. And I think that's kind of more natural for people. Um, this won't go too deep into like Git as a whole theory and stuff, but we talked about the distributed graph tree model in the, in the XKCD art, uh, art comic. What that looks like is, is sort of like this. And so what we have, the things I want to point out here are the things that are actually stored um, on the file system are these just chunks of the, the text that you have changed in your files. And those map up into a tree. And then you have your highest level kind of abstraction of commits. Um, and there's other abstractions as well. But what I wanted to point out is there's these SHA hash, um, the alphanumeric strings that identify the actual code, uh, I'm sorry, the actual uh, artifact that you can use to identify as you work through your project. The other thing with the SHA hash and the way that they uh, have implemented it is that it's cryptographically um, secure so that if changes were made, say, on the server, on the file system, Git will check that out, and if you if you have some error, it will alert you that hey, it's been manipulated on the server. So um, it's it's good from a security standpoint. Once we, uh, in order to get started with Git, uh, you have to do one, at least one thing, which is this: configure your client. And to configure your client, we're going to do it all on the command line. Um, but there is there are clients out there that you can use that makes this uh, process a little easier. Um, but git config dash dash global, and then you do these two properties, user.name and user.email. Once you have done that, you have, uh, you have a git client that can start doing things. Um, in this case, the first thing you might want to do if you're starting a new project is take some existing code, for example. That's like this project.tar.gz, uh, unzip it um, or uncompress it, go into that project and type the command git in it. And so that will initialize an empty repository on your computer in a hidden directory called .git. <clears throat> Once you've done that, you still have an empty repository. So you have to do some more things in order to start tracking your files uh, as you're changing them. So the first thing you need to, uh, to think about or to understand is that you have a working directory, a staging area, and then finally, once you commit, you have the content going into the repository. In this case, uh, in order to get it to that staging area, <coughs> excuse me, um, you have to type git add. And then the dot there is just the local, um, uh, the local uh, uh, folder right there. Looking at this a little bit differently, um, what, you, what you find is you uh, so you might wonder, why would I have a staging area? And the good thing about the staging area in Git is that you might accidentally try to check in files you didn't mean to check in at that point. So for example, you might have a, if I do a lot of Node.js development, so Node.js, when you do npm install, in order to pull down all the dependencies, it creates a directory called node underscore modules, and it just stores all that stuff there. Uh, depending on your style, um, you can check that stuff in, but most people don't. And, um, and so if, for example, you just said git add star because you're like being lazy or whatever, then it would also pick up node modules and say like, cool, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go and get the node modules and track that stuff. But that would really suck if you actually committed at that point because you're like, ah, I didn't really want to do that. So. It, this gives you an opportunity to say to verify the files are going to go in or the right ones, um, and uh, gives you an opportunity to back out of what you're about to do. So you'll work through this process of from your working directory to staging to repository, meaning you've done a commit. So in order to do a commit, you just type in the command git commit dash m is a flag to allow you to put a comment in, and if you don't do dash m, it will still do the commit, but it's going to pop up your default registered IDE uh, or text editor. And in certain circumstances, you might find 
oh shoot, I don't know VI, you know, and that popped up all of a sudden, and now I don't know how to write my <laughs> my commit message. Um, so this just makes it easier. Just dash m, put in your comments, and go. This does not actually share your commit with anyone. It's just on your workstation. So that bullet there that says commit does not push. That's what that what I mean by that. Um, the next concept we'll cover is branching. So branching is a very common and well used and well recommended way of making changes that aren't going to affect the other aspects and the sort of blessed aspect of a project. So there are a few sort of terms in here that I want to point out. One is we have master. You see that one there. Um, in this example of branching, we've taken um, the head, and so that's an internal um, pointer in the Git repository. From It used to be pointing to uh, master, and then we moved it when we created testing as a branch, and that makes a new kind of anticipated commit up there. So that's sort of how you know, you're moving head around ultimately when you're branching, um, and as you move forward in time with your commits. So you can see the commands there. You'll see them uh, a lot more <laughs> a bit later. In order to, well, so when you're finished with your code in your branch, um, or just text or whatever, you might you want to merge it back into the main uh, area, so the master branch. And uh, you don't have to merge into master. You can have branches that come off of other branches and merge into them if you want to do that sort of thing. Um, but for the simplicity uh, part of this, or merge back into master, you need to be on the master branch, and you kind of pull the stuff in from the master branch. So that's uh, something to keep in mind. Sometimes you may find that you need to go back in time, so to speak. And so you, you introduced a bug. You need to get back to a good place, but um, you don't necessarily uh, want to kill the work that you were working on. This is sort of a safe method using git revert, and you revert back to a commit. So that'll uh, actually what it does isn't to erase anything. It takes that commit and kind of moves it forward in time. So that is your new set point uh, with the old information in it. There is a destructive uh, command as well, which is um, git reset. And you would do git reset dash dash force or something like that and that would or dash dash head and that would slam all the changes that you have in your working directory and get rid of them. Um, so I'm not going to cover that one because this usually is satisfactory for most people. It's use. So we're still talking about stuff on our workstation, but eventually you want to share this stuff with your team. And so you do that using what are called remotes and you push to the remotes. And so just to explain this a little bit, um, because you know, like anything, there are these terms that sort of get developed uh, that, are, that are important or significant. One is origin, and one is master. So we've already looked at master a little bit in the branching piece. So when you create a new repo, you have a master branch. Um, when you create basically a default remote, in most cases, the alias that you create, so this name, is going to be origin. And that's just something that ha was developed when the, when the Git project started. And so in order to actually push your code to some other place, uh, you want to say git push, and then the alias, and your branch. So origin master. In most cases, you're not going to be starting a project from scratch, although we're going to work through that from, from uh, scratch. And so if you want to take advantage of code that already exists, you can use this command git clone. And you can git clone if you have SSH established on your um, server, um, or you can use HTTPS. I mentioned earlier uh, there are clients that you can download. Most of them are all free, as far as I understand. I don't think I've seen a, for a paid version of a git client in a long time. Um, but Two common ones uh, that I like are source tree, and there's this one called git kraken. And then also I'm going to show you as we work through in your IDE, ID, most IDEs have plugins that are git aware. And so it will give you visual feedback about whether you've made changes, which files are new, and so on. 
Um, so, yeah, so if you use Vim, for example, you can use this Airblade Vim Git Gutter or Emacs. Maggot is a very common and powerful one there. Okay, so that's kind of the general, uh, general uh, overview. So what I want to do is jump back over here into the actual tutorial. So I'm going to say try again. All right, uh, let me make it bigger. Does anyone have any questions before we jump into things? No? Okay. Cool. I'm going to check with my friends in the back. Can you see that? Is that sufficiently big? Cool. Okay. So we need terminal open because we're going to be like hardcore and do the, do the terminal thing at the CLI. So let's make like a working directory. Um, so make dir, uh, let's see, git workshop. And I'm going to go, I think this is the, my third one this, this week. Uh, and I'm going to go in there. Uh, this actually going into your directory is not a prerequisite to configure. Because what you're doing is you're actually configuring at the global level. So there's a global config on your workstation. Um, and there are also local ones. And so what we're going to do is say git config dash dash global and then user.name my name. So I'll just show you that. And we'll put Ashley Roach. Mine's already configured, so I'm just reconfiguring it. And then similarly, um, we'll do email. And like that. So you get no feedback, which is good. Uh, if you get an error, it'll give you an error. So that kind of looks like that. OK, so that is kind of blocking and tackling like out of the way. So in our, in our new project, um, in the learning lab, it's called git-intro. But for me, I, uh, for these ones, I like to actually create a new one that's kind of unique to our group. Um, and we want to type git init. And so like I mentioned before, uh, we have the feedback that this was initialized, an empty Git repository, and you can see it ends in .git. So if I look in my directory, sure enough, it's there. And uh, if we actually look inside there real quick, you'll see uh, some files and folders. So head I mentioned before, we'll, we'll look inside that real quick. If you look at that config file, um, the config file contains information about your branches and so on. So like uh, if you look at, oops, uh, get, you can see that's how this is pointing currently, head is point, pointing currently to master. And we'll just do a quick look at uh, the config. And so because I was setting globally, you won't see the, my username or my name in the email. But you will see some basic information. And we'll look a little bit further when we get into branches and remotes. You can see some information appear there. OK. So that kind of gives you a bit of an orientation on the, the directory structure. Um, the first thing that I like to point out is that there's this command git status. And git status gives you the status of the repository at this current moment in time. Meaning, is there, are there new files? Are there untracked files? Are there changes to files? And so on. In this case, uh, it tells you very clearly there's nothing to commit, and we're on the initial commit. So there's, you know, that's because we haven't added anything at all to the actual um, repository area. The next thing we're going to do, of course, is we want to add a file. So I'm going to just say touch first.txt and We'll open it up real quick. So I'm using Atom uh, to uh, demo this, I suppose. Um, in Atom, uh, actually, let me do this real quick. Sorry. It's better if you have the full folder structure. OK. So you can see that, and I know it's a little small in the back. Atom doesn't like zoom very much. Um, I don't think I can zoom it. You can see that first.txt is green. And uh, we're going to add this file or content in the file and save it. 
So if we go back to our command line and we type git status again, so it's changed. So now it says initial commit, but you have first.txt as an untracked file. And so what we need to do is we need to track that file. To track the file, uh, you have to actually do that process that I described earlier, where you go from stage into the staging area to a commit. So to stage it, it's uh, simple enough to type git add and first.txt and look at git status again. And now it changed to this uh, green thing, uh, or green color, and says changes to be committed. And you can see, remember I was telling you, you can remove stuff from there. It says use git rm dash dash cached with file to unstage. So that's a way to back out any accidental com uh, staged files. And so finally, yay, we get to commit. So git commit dash m and uh, We're, gonna, we're, we're making an inspirational quote you know, repository here in our, uh, in our file. So I just committed the, the change. So that was that one line that we added to the file. And this tells us the same thing that we would expect. So one file changed, one insertion, meaning one line. You have the SHA hash, the message that you import, inputted, and a bit of permissions. The permissions that are saved by Git aren't necessarily as full fidelity as what the file system on Unix or Windows, for that matter, will do. Um, but it's enough to kind of, if you have an executable, it comes back as executable when someone pulls the, the project, for example. So we've committed the changes once. And now we're going to take a look at the actual commit history. And the command for doing that is git log. And we'll use this a little bit uh, as we go along. But you have a commit with a SHA hash, and then your quote, and uh, obviously some metadata about when it happened and who did it. There are, you'll notice, two different. There's a, Git uses this short version quite often in the UIs that you work with. And that's because typically that's enough unique information for Git to locate your commit. Um, but for some reason, some point in time, you may need to use that full um, this full commit, and saying git log is one way to get to that information. Okay? So we're going to add a new line of inspiring quotes in here. And uh, we'll save it and do the same process. Let me make this a little more at the top. So I'm going to do it. Oh, there's a shortcut version on how to commit. So you can say git commit dash A, so that will add all the files um, by itself, and then dash M, and we'll say added new quote. So I didn't have to go through that git add and then git commit. Instead, I did git commit dash A. If you do git commit dash A and you have files that aren't tracked, it'll, it won't actually add those ones. So that's one reason to use git add. Um, before I click on Adam, I want to. I, I meant to show you before. Uh, you can see there's. It's giving us some clues about things that are new or changing. So new in this client is green, and the yellow first.txt. Remember it was green before. Now it's yellow. So you can identify. Oh, okay. Something has changed in that file. And as soon as I clicked on it, it refreshed its state and it figured out. Okay, it's all committed. So that's why that stuff went away. The, um, the next thing, though, is you'll note that, that I made a spelling error. Um, so we're going to fix that spelling error over here. We called it Ralph Waldo Emerson. It should be Emerson. Um, so we'll just go through that same process. Oops. Yeah, I noticed I've missed that. M. Cool. So we've made the change. We're moving along. Um, let's see if we can look at the differences between two commits. So you might want to know uh, why on earth um, this typo doesn't exist anymore and where it was introduced, for example. Um, so what you can do is you can use git log. 
And so we have three different commits, and we're going to compare this commit, and we're going to do it in another window. In this window, we'll do git diff and take our first commit, and we're going to compare that with our second commit. Oops. And I got to do it with put a space in there. Cool. So this gives us a view into what changed in the file. Um, obviously, version control, this is like one of the key things, uh, other than going back and checking changes. Having the, vis the, um, the visibility of, OK, what's changing in my project? Um, if someone changed this port, like which port did they, what was it before? You can do that when you've got things under version control. OK. So um, the next thing we're going to jump into is branching. So let's go back here to labs. And do our git filter again. So branching. OK. So branching, I mentioned before, is this ability to take a copy of what we're working on and do it in an isolated place. Uh, let's say that we want to add a new feature to our product if we're a software developer. Or in this case, we're going to add a new inspirational quote. Maybe you're going to add a new block of YAML to describe some uh, infrastructure. In that case, you want to create a branch in order to do that work that then other people can look at later and validate what you're doing. So in order to create a branch, we just say git branch and give it a name. So let's look at our git branch by listing, you can just say git branch, and that lists uh, the branches that are available. In order to actually start working in the um, Shakespeare branch, we have to actually check it out. So one handy thing in, in this shell that I'm using is that you can see it points out that I'm on the master branch. Um, it's not uncommon for people to just do the branch, forget to check it out, and then just start working. And then you go, oh, oops. <laughs> It's all in. It's it's in the wrong place. In that case, you can use stashing. Um, so we won't cover that very much here, but you can stash your changes, switch to the branch, and then reapply that stash changes. Um, that way, you didn't lose all the work that you you had done, or have to like line by line copy and paste it somewhere else or something like that. So git check out Shakespeare. And so now we're in the the Shakespeare branch. When we've done that, uh, we're going to just add some text here. So to be or not to be, that is the question. Add our new quote, save it, and we will commit it. You can also delete branches uh, with the dash D flag. Um, but we're going to actually set up this um, next thing, which is merge conflicts while we do this. So I've saved it. I'm going to commit it. So git commit dash a dash m. OK. Going back over here, you can see we have this new line. And in order to set up a merge conflict, a merge conflict happens on a line by line basis. So typically, um, if you're working, say, in the Shakespeare branch, and someone works at the same chunk of code that you are working on or same configuration, it's possible that when the merge happens, Git doesn't know which one is the right one. So it has a way of helping you figure out you know, or help it figure out which are the right things. So in this case, we're going to say, cool, I want to add this like circa 2000 quote here. Um, and then we're going to commit it. So we're going to set up a conflict. <laughs> and we'll go git check out. Oh, actually, I want to do one other thing because of the line by line aspect of things. If I add some text at the bottom here as well, 
Uh, well, let's not do that. Sorry, changing my mind. We're going to check out the master branch. And you'll see um, this quote went away, and my uh, information over here went away. If we make a change, like we say this is actually circa 1800, and we commit this, Oh, you can see if you don't do the dash A, that's the error that you would get. OK, so now we have circa 1800 on this line, and we have circa 2000 on the other line in the other branch. Let's say we didn't realize they were working in that other branch, and we're going to say, cool, I want to merge Shakespeare. So I'm doing this from master, and I'm pulling, and oh, crap. Conflict. And so a lot of cases, like the first time I saw this, I was like, uh-oh, uh-oh. <laughs> I don't know what to do. Um, and when I looked in here, I was like, what? The, what is all this stuff? But um, you know, thankfully, you guys are getting this nice introduction. Uh, so you won't have that same reaction. And it's kind of cool. I want to point out a couple things here. One is that uh, you'll notice this line, or this quote, merged in no problem. Um, but it's pointing out that in the head, so that was, again, kind of referencing back the master branch that we're at, um, is conflicting with this branch, Shakespeare. And it just, it just separates them out and gives you some markups so you can determine uh, which one is the right one. And so these aren't contemporary quotes. So we're going to do the 1800s. And we just delete this markup. And you do your commit. Cool. So now we've kind of cleaned things up. The Shakespeare branch still has that incorrect information, but we clean things up in the master branch here. All right. So we're going to move to um, sharing your changes. And what I showed you before in sharing your changes, um, you shared your changes using a remote concept and using the command git push. So now would be a good time to go to your GitHub account and create a new repository. And in here, we're going to say git workshop, woo, workshop <laughs> three. Um, and we'll, we won't initialize it or anything like that. So it does give you the way to initialize it. Make it public is fine. And so in GitHub, uh, we now have an empty repository uh, that we can send our rep local repository information over to. And it gives you two little chunks of in instructions here. One is, OK, if you don't have an existing repository like we do, you can kind of initialize it this way. So this looks familiar. Git init, git add, git commit, add origin, and push. In our case, we already have an existing repository, so we're going to add the remote, and then we're going to push. And so you guys should be able to browse to that URI up there, um, aroach slash git dash workshop dash three, and you'll see this stuff come up as you go. So I'm going to add this remote, and I have SSH uh, set up. So GitHub has my public key from my local workstation. So I don't have to do any logging in explicitly. And then we're going to say git push. Ah, sorry for jumping around there too fast. So git push uh, dash u origin master. Cool. So it succeeded. And we have, uh, it did some compression. It wrote the data across the wire. Um, and it says it did that to GitHub, a roach slash blah de blah, and it created a new branch. And we're going to track the remote branch. So if I do git pull and some of these things over time, if changes happen there, I'll get notified. So let's refresh here. And now we have an actual repo that we could share with other people. 
Cool. Um, so GitHub, I'll give you some, uh, some little bit of interesting things here. You have uh, the ability to edit in this actual page. Now, if you're doing like actual development, uh, probably not what you want to do. Um, but like text files, like markdown, that kind of thing, it's convenient. So like when I wrote the thing uh, that we were started out with, I just did it straight here. Um, now, I don't, and that way I don't even have a copy on my local workstation at this point. But the other thing is that up here, there's this collaborative way of working um, in, in Git. And so you can do this thing called forking. So I'm going to have to rely on at least one person in the audience to fork my repo so we can do this demo. Is any, any guinea pigs? Volunteers? Come on, volunteer. Tom, can you be my, you don't have a laptop? Anybody? OK. Yay, Paul's going to do it for me. OK, so within, uh, within this, there's this pull request area. And we'll look at that in a minute. But once Paul does a fork, this will change to a one. And what a fork is, is it's going to take my code, because Paul or any of you do not have right access to my repo. If you want to benefit from the code that I've written, but enhance it or fix it, you can do that and then contribute back to me by following this process of forking and submitting a pull request. So have you, been, have you made it there, Paul? Just now? OK, cool. Oh, I see. So we have a fork. Now I'll click on this. And they have a nice little graph that shows um, here's my check-ins and so on. And somewhere it will show me Paul, I think. Maybe you have to do your pull request. Um, but regardless, now we know, OK, someone else is actually going to maybe make fixes or contribute back. So Paul, if you wouldn't mind going to the first.txt file, editing it, and then maybe add a new line down there on line five. When he does that, he'll commit the changes, and he can create a new branch and commit and start a pull request. You don't have to do that in one click. You can do it in two clicks, but this is convenient. So try and do that for me, Paul, or anyone else. You guys are attentive audience. It's great. Are you guys learning stuff? Yeah? <laughs> Good. As long as you, what, what I'm hoping is it, it, this takes some of maybe the intimidation out of using Git, for example, so that you can try. I mean, I would encourage you at the end of today or at the end of Cisco Live, like, just start with a text file like I was doing and, and work through a, um, something. Take notes for a meeting um, and then push it to GitHub and see how it kind of works. OK. You going there, Paul? Did you make your pull request? OK. I don't see it. Should have a one up here. <laughs> Let me show you what new pull request looks like so you guys can see what it means. Um, when you click new, when you have a code change, you'll actually have, it'll show you all of the, the deltas and everything down there. Um, and then you will actually see the, um, I may have a fork I can show you as well. Let's see. Yeah, so like this one. So this is a lab that I was working on. It's been forked um, 30 times uh, as well. Let's see if it was forked from me. If I go back here, this was forked and has pull requests waiting for it. So if I look in here, then uh, the pull requests from uh, adding Martin to the contributors list, it came from this user and this branch. Um, and it's being proposed back on the main, uh, the main repo. And it tells you some more information like, OK, this was the commit. You can go and inspect everything. So show me the commit. 
Um, it can combine multiple commits, for example, that's why. And then you can see that it has this uh, new line in it. You can review changes, you can do comments, and so on. So if you need to do like code reviews, um, this is a kind of lightweight way of doing that. Um, and then finally, you can, uh, in, in our case, we'd have to resolve conflicts manually, in this case. Um, and then you can comment and or actually merge the code. You got it? No. Did you make your pull request? OK. Let's see it work. Come on. Do, 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 do. All right. Code. I don't think you made your pull request. Well, anyone else? Can anyone else make a pull re a, a fork? No? All right. Let me show you on that other repo, because I have rights on that one. Um, all right. Let's get back over there. Repositories. 101. So in this case, if I come in here and I say contributors, and I'm going to add a new, a, a new new line, or let's go like that. So we'll add some more changes. We will um, commit it. And when I go back to my repo, um, it's going to say create a new pull request. So when I create this new pull request, I can propose it. It shows the deltas. And this is for me trying to say, you know, please add my stuff over there on the base fork. So create pull request. You can explain your stuff. You say pull request. Checking, and it has no conflicts with the base branch. Um, so I could say merge pull request. Um, now we're over here on IMAPEX dash training. So that's kind of that flow of doing pull requests and, and one of those benefits of distributed version control. This sort of style is, a little, is definitely different than what you might see if you're used to using subversion. Um, so that's kind of the general uh, overview of everything. Um, uh, I had on the GitHub page some of these links for cheat sheet, so it is handy maybe to cheat a little bit. Um, you can get reminded of the different commands. If you want to know more about those workflows that I mentioned before, Atlassian has a really nice tutorial. And these links are um, also available on that, that repo. Um, the, uh, the last thing I will show you real quick is, the, is a client. So SourceTree is one of the ones I use a lot. Um, it gives you sort of, it doesn't zoom very well, I apologize. Um, but it gives you this history that's easy to navigate through. You can see all those changes. Um, it gives you more information all at once than just your, um, you know, your command line. So you're not going to have quite as many um, things to uh, deal with. And I'll show you the Git Kraken client too, because it's just these guys like invested so much time in U UI. I think it's pretty awesome. <laughs> um, so this is like a project I was, I've been working on, but you know it has pretty uh, these pretty lines and people's uh, faces and whatnot if they're registered. But similar ideas gives you a way to easily navigate through, see the changes that have made your remotes uh, with branches and stashes and all the things that we talked about all in one kind of compact UI. So um, you can definitely use these. Uh, most people use a combination of a client and a, and a you know, CLI as well. So that's about my time. If you have any questions or comments or anything, feel free to email me or follow me on Twitter. Um, we do have like, like I said, all that stuff is available online. Um, there are other resources as well I pointed to in, the, um, in that GitHub page that I had up earlier. Like, um, I'll pull that up for maybe people that weren't seeing that when they first got here. So let's go, I'll just go to GitHub because that's easier. Um, we have some more in-depth uh, tutorials on Git as well that are in uh, a, a sort of training area that we uh, maintain called IMAPEX, or the Immersive Application Experience. Um, so that's this right here. And then uh, if you're curious about that, oh my ZSH shell, uh, someone asked me about that the other day, so I was like, well, I'll put the link to it. 
But uh, yeah, so thanks again, everyone. I hope you have had a great week. And uh, you know, I guess one more day left. Enjoy the party tonight. Um, and <laughs> yeah, see, I got nods for that, um, <laughs> which is great. No, uh, no version control jokes during the actual party. I will forbid that. Um, but thanks again, and uh, you guys have a great rest of the week. And safe travels home as well. Thanks.